Okay, hello everybody. Thanks very much for coming to the uh, Chameleon session. Um, I'm Kate Cahey. I'm from Argonne National Lab and University of Chicago. Uh, both fantastic institutions, Argonne National Lab, uh, home to the fifth fastest supercomputer in the world, uh, University of Chicago, one of the top 10 universities uh, in the world. And we've got something called Computation Institute that spans both institutions. Other than that, I also lead a very exciting new project called Chameleon. Uh, so Chameleon is a, a project in experimental computer science test beds. Um, you know that uh, different sciences have different experimental devices. They have telescopes, microscopes, other scopes. The question is, uh, what do uh, computer scientists have? How can computer scientists operate, run, and operate their instruments, their experiments? And uh, we decided that, uh, that a computer science exper experimental infrastructure looks very much like a gecko with a curly tail, and so we named it Chameleon. Uh, it's a project of five partners, University of Chicago partners with TAC, those are two resource hosting institutions, and in addition we're also partnering with Northwestern, um, uh, Ohio State University, and UTSA. The project is funded by uh, the National Science Foundation. So. Um, a few, uh, a few words about how we decided to design Chameleon, how we decided to uh, design this experimental uh, infrastructure for computer science. So our, our first um, uh, point of our strategy was to make it large scale, because we know that um, a hot topic in cloud computing right now is how to marry HPC and cloud computing. Uh, big data is another thing that uh, people like exploring. And most of all, we wanted computer science experiments to scale from very small ones to potentially very large ones. So accordingly, we decided to buy as large a test bed as we could afford. Uh, and that means six, 650 nodes, uh, almost 15,000 uh, cores, five petabytes of storage distributed over two sites connected with 100G network, five petabytes of storage uh, designed to help with big data experiments. And you notice immediately that you know, we, we scale in terms of compute and we scale in terms of storage. We don't scale in, the number, in, in terms of the number of sites, right? So you can't scale in every possible dimension because then you don't scale in the financial dimension. But we essentially designed the test bed to complement another test bed called Genie that already exists that has something like 50 sites, right? So people who want to experiment with networking, with highly distributed computing can use Genie, uh, which has very small sites, but many of them, uh, and people who want to experiment with HPC and, and big data can use Chameleon, uh, which has only two sites, but very large. Uh, second uh, design strategy point was for this infrastructure to be deeply reconfigurable. So like its namesake, Chameleon should adapt itself to the needs that, to the experimental needs that you have, right? And it should be as, as close as possible to what you have in your lab. Uh, you should have detailed information about the resources. You should be able to provision them in a fine grain. Uh, you should be able to reconfigure them, power on, power off, have root on them, of course, reboot them, um, have access to the console, to the, to the BIOS if necessary, and so forth. And this is necessary in order to support um, isolated, repeatable, and reproducible experiments. Right? If you run your research on, on Amazon Cloud, for example, uh, you are in a, in a multi-tenant environment, and you never know how much something that somebody else is doing is influencing your experiment, right? Even if, even if you're in a single tenancy condition, you still get interference with, from the hypervisor, right? So it was very important for us that our users, when they get to run on Chameleon, get bare metal, access to bare metal hardware. Uh, our third point, third characteristics, is we wanted the testbed to be connected. Um, there is not something like parallel workload archive um, uh, created for cloud computing. A parallel workload archive is, is where people um, uh, have traces that characterize the load on, on uh, HPC machines, right? There isn't something like that exist in existence right now for cloud computing. Google made some traces available, but it, on, on a somewhat ad hoc basis. And it's hard for people right now to validate their cloud computing research, right? Because they they don't have access to um, you know, something that represents a typical cloud workload. 
Um, so we wanted, we partnered with people running production clouds uh, in CERN and in Open Science Data Cloud, which is a fantastic biology targeted cloud at University of Chicago, uh, with Rackspace and Google and with others to get those traces from them so that uh, researchers could have um, an easier time constructing their experiment. You go to one place, you can get resources, you can get traces, you can construct your experiments more easily. And of course, sharing appliances, which is a partnership with users. And we already have some users who contributed appliances to Chameleon, which makes it easier for others to build new algorithm and, and new methods on top, of, uh, on top of the frameworks that they developed. Um, of course, complementary, as I already said, complementary to Genie, and sustainable. In other words, easy to maintain, easy to share. And I'll go back to that later. Uh, a few words about Chameleon hardware. Uh, most of our hardware is composed of what we call a standard cloud unit. It's essentially a, a rack that is composed of uh, 42 compute nodes. Each node is an Intel Haswell processor and four storage nodes, which are also Intel Haswells, but they have uh, each storage node, uh, in addition, has 16 two terabyte disks. So if you add it all up per rack, that gives you 128 terabytes of, of storage space. And if you add it all up across the racks, that's 1.6 petabyte. So in addition to that, we also have 3.6 petabytes uh, of global store where users can put their experimental data so that it's already there available for them to run their big data experiments. Um, one of the, uh, so we've got 10 of those standard cloud units um, at TAC, which they, they all together form um, a large homogeneous partition where you can run scalability experiments. We've got a couple of those at University of Chicago. And, and one of those rocks has InfiniBand on it so that you can run experiments with you know, Ethernet, you can run experiments with InfiniBand. As time goes by, this year we're going to be acquiring additional heterogeneous hardware. We're going to be acquiring GPUs, putting them into racks. You can run with GPUs, without GPUs. Um, we're going to be buying more SSDs. We already have SSDs on the storage nodes, but we're going to buy more and different ones so that you can experiment with different storage hierarchies. So it's all designed to be homogeneous from one point of view, so that you can run scalability experiments, but heterogeneous to a smaller extent from another point of view. So in addition to all those things, we will also buy some non-x86 uh, nodes, and those will be Atom microservers and ARM microservers, so that people can experiment with those as well, but those will be in much smaller uh, quantities. So here is the, essentially a slide that describes all the hardware that I just um, uh, talked about. Um, and here is one slide that, that tells you what research we expected to support on Chameleon. So if you look at the, at the bottom level, on the lowest end of the spectrum, we expected to support research in virtualization, operating systems, things that require a lot of control. And typically people who do that research also have the, uh, the skills to develop their own bare metal images, right, with, with interesting operating systems, experimental operating systems, and so forth. On the other end of the spectrum, we wanted to just run a plain KVM cloud, OpenStack KVM cloud, because this is very much in demand from people experimenting with new applications, uh, educational projects, and even people who are uh, just developing maybe elastic scaling algorithms, resource management algorithms, that sort of thing. Right? So, so here they have a ready-to-go uh, virtualized cloud. In the middle of that, we have something for that last category of people. So once they develop their resource management infrastructure or their elastic scaling infrastructure, they can drop down the level and now deploy OpenStack, their own version of OpenStack, nobody else is using, and run their algorithms, run their experiments in an isolated environment where it doesn't get interference from other users. So, you know, those are kind of three uh, categories of users that, that, that we were seeing um, and three categories of skills from, from those users. So as we were talking to users and asking them what capabilities an experimental testbed should have from their perspective, 
we sort of came, came up with a description of the experimental workflow from the perspective of the user. So if you think about it, if you want to uh, do a computer science experiment, the first thing is you design experiment, right? So maybe you want to experiment with cash hierarchies or something like that. So you design this experiment, then you say, hmm, in order to, to validate uh, you know, my new algorithm, there's a certain type of hardware that I'm going to need, right? So for, um, you know, for different storage hierarchies, you're going to need something which has, you know, let's say storage available at different bandwidth or, or uh, uh, with different latencies or, or, or something like that. So what can I find that, that is similar to the model that, that my new algorithm is based on? So you uh, discover those resources. And here we found that users really want fine-grained descriptions, sometimes down to the serial number of individual components, because it's very important to know if somebody changes the disk, you know, upgrades the disk or, or uh, changes different, it has a different power signature, your experiment suddenly is going to return different results. And you won't know why unless you know that this is a very different component, right? So complete up to date, which implies a, an automated update of, of, of that storage description. Right? If it's not automated, then uh, human error comes into play and, and so forth, and it's, it's not strict. And, and here's the coolest thing, versioned. Right, so that you can always say, I ran on this version of, of the hardware. Because while um, understanding that, oh, the serial number changed or something like that uh, is all great and fine, you don't want to go through that level of detail every time you run your experiments. And, and so this version now captures firmware changes, it captures hardware changes, um, all sorts of things. So I was, for example, surprised since we went public at the end of July last year, we've had 20 different versions of the testbed, right? And if you can, in the paper, if you can say, I ran on the testbed version such and such, then people can understand better what context your experiments were run, right? And they can get an excruciatingly detailed description of the hardware and the firmware that, that came into play. And then finally, verifiable, right? What if somebody changes the previous user, let's say, change the firmware on you? You want to find that out, right? You, you want to find that out and you want to change it back and make sure that you're running experiments on the resources as advertised. So once you discover the resources, you decide those are the resources I need to run, you need to provision them. And here it's important that they are provisioned in an interactive fashion, right? So ideally, we would get resources on demand when we come to the testbed, but if you want to um, if you want to work on many, many resources, if you in fact would like to work on the whole testbed, on hundreds of nodes, chances are that you come to the testbed and people are already running, right? Somebody's already running and you just can't boot them off, right? Because you want to go. But if you think about, about this far enough ahead, chances are that you will be in fact able to reserve the whole testbed. So advanced reservations were very important for us and of course isolation between users. And then, you know, once you have the test bed, you want to configure it. And here, uh, as I already said, very important that we have access to bare metal reconfiguration that is deeply reconfigurable. In other words, um, access to console. Many of your users do need that. That you can map multiple configurations onto the same reservation because many computer science experiments look like, you know, change something repeat your experiments, change something in the environment again, repeat your experiments, right? So it's so very important that you can do that, that you can snapshot your work, and that you can easily deal with complex appliances. And then finally, you configured something, you're running it, and now you want to monitor it. And here, the most important thing is that you'd like to, to have access uh, to, to various hardware characteristics, monitor various har hardware characteristics that normally are not um, available to you. So, uh, we looked at all of this. We, we had interviews with uh, about 20 teams uh, prior to writing the proposal for developing this testbed and, and developed those requirements based on them. And then here is a, a graphical representation of what we started out with, right? It's, it's an empty page. This is exactly what we started out with. And it was an enormous opportunity because we knew what kind of testbed we wanted to develop and we were not bound to use any specific technology. We could research and use what was best for our needs. And um, 
uh, as I already said, we went through this um, requirements stage when we interviewed different research teams. As soon as the project started, we formulated the architecture. And when we started looking at different technologies, what could we use to build this testbed? And there were many different proposals. Most of them did not survive in close, close encounter with the architecture. Um, and then, um, you know, we whittled it down eventually to OpenStack. And, and something called Grid 5000, which is an experimental test bed in, in France that had most of the characteristic, the characteristics that we wanted. Um, and OpenStack had the advantage that, you know, long term, uh, we could have a sustainable solution where we work with a large community, uh, that we contribute to, and that helps us develop our test bed. Um, however, there was a lot to develop upfront, uh, so it represented a very high short-term risk, but lower long-term risk. And Grid 5000, on the other hand, right, was very, um, a very small, very low short-term risk, but higher long-term risk. So eventually, we decided to pick OpenStack to, the, to, um, to implement what I just described. Once we started the implementation, we started it in um, uh, the, the, the first code started uh, in, in January of 2015. Uh, our, uh, it took about three months to our uh, technology preview release. So really, using OpenStack, we managed to implement this testbed within just three months, which was surprised even us. Um, the, uh, the infrastructure that we put on top of the testbed, we ended up calling Chameleon Infrastructure, or CHI for short, and it's about, you know, th those numbers are of course a little bit taken, sorry, taken out of a hat, but we figure it's about 65% OpenStack, 10% Grid 5000 technology, and 25% our own special sauce, which is integration, implementation of snapshotting, contributions to Blazar, and so forth. So here is, here is a breakdown of those, of those four different aspects of the testbed that I was talking about earlier. Um, as far as discovery, you know, on top here, you've got the requirements, the requirements that I already discussed. And we used Grid 5000 technology for that because they had a really well thought through and extremely detailed resource representation for the testbed, written, developed really with um, experimental science in mind. Um, we had to, um, you know, of course, develop our own uh, portal representation of, of, um, of that information. We had to develop a mapper which took this representation and now generated something that Nova could understand because then it worked with uh, Nova on the other side. Um, so we had to do some work here, but, but uh, uh, essentially it's something that worked for us. Also, we used um, Grid 5000 checks for testbed, uh, testbed verification. So something you run after you get your testbed allocation, you run this to make sure that the resources you got are as described. For provisioning, we wanted something that had advanced reservation. We looked at Nova, and it did not have advanced reservation, only had on-demand. But fortunately, OpenStack already had an incubated component called Blazar that we started working with, made contribution to that component, contributed, essentially developed whatever it is we needed to develop in order to deploy it and have our users uh, work with that. So uh, definite contribution there. You see on the Gantt chart on the side what it looks like when you come to the test bed and you know there's this orange user running, there's this orange reservation there, but you want to reserve the whole test bed, so you've got time on the x-axis, so you have to look a little bit a little bit ahead in order to do that. Um, configure and interact, we of course wanted to work with bare metal, and, and for that we started working with uh, Ironic, which and then we wanted to uh, to allow deep reconfigurability, so we uh, made our own venture in um, in console management, but we're also looking forward to working with the commu community on that and uh, making sure that, uh, that that everybody's on the same page as far as what those capabilities should look like. We added snapshotting, our own implementation of snapshotting, which is currently available from the command line. Um, hopefully, uh, in the ironic session today, it was on my wish list from, uh, to, to come from the OpenStack community. It would make it much easier for our users. Um, and we're developing our own appliance management tools that manage OpenStack images, uh, generate them, manage complex uh, appliances, and so forth. We also have an appliance marketplace that users um, uh, can, 
uh, the users can contribute to. And then finally, instrumentation monitoring. Uh, not much to say there, the same requirements that I presented before, and we're using Solometer as the aggregator of the uh, monitoring information, and then we're writing our own drivers for the different types of monitoring information that users will need. So here is uh, a little bit about Chameleon timeline and status. The project, uh, like I said, NSF-funded project started in October 2014. Um, we, uh, TAC and University of Chicago earlier partnered on a project called Future Grid, which was essentially uh, configuring virtualized clouds. And so we, we configured very quickly a virtualized cloud on, on old hardware that we had as a bridge for the Future Grid community. So that was available uh, still that same year. And then started developing Chameleon in January 2015. In, uh, in, at the beginning of um, April 2015, uh, we uh, made the technology preview of, of our uh, experimental capabilities available. Um, and then uh, eventually we built the, the, between April and, uh, and June, we built the new hardware, received the new hardware, built it, put our uh, implementation uh, of, of the experimental infrastructure on the hardware, and at the end of July, we went into public release, made, uh, made Chameleon available to users. So today we've got over 700 users, and we've got over 180 projects. Uh, and in this year, one of the major capabilities that we're planning to um, offer to our users is uh, we're planning to deploy more heterogeneous hardware. So what do all these users do, the, the 70 plus users? There are many, many projects. I picked five highlights of the projects, uh, of the research projects people are doing. The first project is um, from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Yuyuzu is a is a student as a, at a research team that develops lightweight virtualization for HPC resources. So there's this debate in the community right now whether to use virtualization or container, containerization, right? On, on one hand, virtualization gives you more features than running containers. On the other hand, containers are much faster. So Yu was doing a project where she was uh, comparing containers and, and uh, well, she was comparing Docker and KVM to be specific. Uh, you've got a graph uh, of, of the performance comparison and how it scales. Uh, in this graph, she scales to 64 nodes, but I know that she's had graphs that uh, where she was doing 256 nodes, which is, of course, possible on Chameleon. Uh, and then uh, below, you see Yu Yu proudly presenting her, her poster at uh, Supercomputing 15. So what did she need in order to make those experiments work? She needed, of course, bare metal access, the power on, power off. She needed uh, to be able to deploy custom kernels, so she needed console access to debug it. She needed up-to-date hardware, right? Doesn't make sense to do this performance comparison if the hardware is not up-to-date. And, and she really needed large-scale experimentation, right? Because if you look at the graphs comparing Docker and KVM on one node, uh, the performance is almost the same. Right? It, is, it is the scale that brings out the differences. So here is another project, right? Exascale Operating Systems. Um, uh, this is a project at Argon, developed at Argon. It's, um, it's part of the Argo project that develops uh, uh, operating system for the next scale of the resources. Um, and if you want to know why, just imagine that you put on 50 pounds and you're trying to fit into the same clothes, right? If, you, if, if we get an exascale supercomputer, we need to develop an operating system that takes advantage of the new architecture and can run things on it uh, in, a, in a, a very fast manner that can take, take advantage of it. Um, so what they needed for the test bed was bare metal over configuration. Uh, they needed to boot kernel with different parameters, essentially do parameter search over the space uh, in which they were developing. Um, they, they needed to be able to reconfigure things very fast. So they were throwing many different images repeatedly um, on the test bed. Um, and they needed hardware performance counters, you know, many core uh, nodes and so forth. Uh, if you want to find out more about the research, there's a paper that they recently published um, on the uh, system-wide power management with Argo. And you see uh, Swan Perano, uh, who was running the experiments, um, uh, showing a demonstration at, at supercomputing um, uh, last year uh, of his system. So at Argon, of course, we do have a supercomputer or two knocking around the lab, right? But not every institution is so fortunate. 
And in particular, uh, one of our users here doing research on cloud security, they're classifying security attacks. Uh, they come from a very small university of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, so it's a, a very small school. It's a historically black college. And uh, what we're trying to do is give resources to those schools, that's the whole point of building a national resource is that people can share and that it levels playing field for small schools that uh, you know have the talent and the grit to come up with interesting um, research results and then compete well uh, or, or compare well with, with richer institutions that, uh, that have many resources. So their research was like I said, classifying cybersecurity attacks. Um, and their testbed uh, requirements were essentially an easy to use OpenStack installation. So that was our KVM virtualized OpenStack uh, uh, installation. Um, and access to the same infrastructure for multiple collaborators. So there's uh, uh, infrastructure collaboration from many, many schools. And then the next project I wanted, to, we were fortunate in having uh, one of our users right here. So I would like to introduce Paul Ruth, who will tell you about what he's doing with federated networks. Yes, yeah, so I'm Paul Ruth from uh, Renaissance Computing Institute called RENCI at UNC Chapel Hill. And um, the work that we do there is uh, to federate network clouds for domain science. So that's you know, a bunch of words, but what does that mean? Um, as an example, uh, I'd say like that our project is mostly under this project called Exogenie, which is, Kate mentioned earlier, the Genie project, and that was a, a, a federation of cloud computing that has a wider reach, but is smaller clouds, smaller individual clouds. So what we have here is about 20 um, small OpenStack installations all over the world, so we're in three countries, or four countries on three continents. Um, we can get compute network and storage from these different OpenStack installations, but with, you know, our special sauce is that we consider the dynamic circuit providers that sit between these racks to be another type of cloud provider, but they're providing layer two circuits between our racks. So, so what you can do with Exogeny is you can get compute network and storage in various places all around the world, but we can also give you a layer two network that connects your, your resources. So this is, this is great, it's very powerful. We're a wide reaching um, footprint. And what we want to do with Chameleon, where we're, we're somewhere between a user of Chameleon and helping them develop pieces of Chameleon. So what we want to do is be able to deploy on top of Chameleon new exogeny sites that still have this power to stitch layer two networks with the rest of the exogeny federation. And this requires um, a lot of thinking about how to use Neutron and the different um, networking capabilities of OpenStack. It doesn't quite fit our model, so we're working with K to, to make this happen. Um, so this is what we call stitching of the layer two networks. And uh, the target here is HPC because that's kind of what we do. So we need InfiniBand and SROV and MPI and many cores and all these things that, that all the HPC people have been talking about. Um, it's a picture of uh, our group. There's a couple of people on there that are, have moved on to bigger and better things, but they've done a lot of work. So we wanted to include them in, in the picture. Um, and that's about all I had. And if you want any more information, um, come find me later. Okay, thanks much. Okay, one last project is teaching cloud computing. Um, so this is a, this is a project from by users from University of Arizona, um, and you know as I'm sure everybody's familiar, there are many applications, scientific applications right now that discovered that uh, if you have resources on demand, what they used to run on their laptop, right, and used to take days, but if you have an application that can be embarrassingly parallel and you can provision resources on demand, you can run it on multiple uh, resources and what used to take days all of a sudden takes hours, right, or even minutes. So uh, it turns out is that one of the researchers at University of Arizona had such applications and the challenge now was to build a harness that would take those computer, uh, computers, well, uh, cloud computing resources and, and run the applications on those cloud computing resources. The application, by the way, is, is looking for exoplanets. Those are planets that orbit other stars than the sun, sun being a, a very special star. So um, the, the, one, of, one of his colleagues uh, in computer science department said, why don't I organize a class around this? This will be a class project. And later on, once we have this, this application specific infrastructure that runs this application on, on cloud computing, we can share it with others. But the question now was, where, where do we find those resources? Uh, and, and very easily, they could just come to Chameleon and run it on our KVM cloud. So they developed, the, the students that you see in the picture here, 
develop this infrastructure on our KVM cloud. And again, what they what they needed is easy to use infrastructure as a service with KVM. And in the student's case in particular, the ease of use is something that needs to be emphasized, right? If if it's too hard, then all of a sudden the professor has has to spend a lot of cycles with them um, explaining things to them. Minimum startup time, right? Minimum startup time in terms of how you use the infrastructure and how how you um, um, you know how, how how you spin up the uh, um, the individual users, um, uh, support for distributed workers, and and also storage, important storage because uh, in this particular application, of course, it's a it's a data mining application, so uh, they need to store the data somewhere. So. Um, uh, th those are the applications. Now, what we have in the pipeline, um, our, our year one theme for the for the first year of the project is let's make this test bit possible. Let's build the test bit, and we built the test bit. We deployed the hardware, we developed the software to to make it run, to give the u our users the capability that they wanted. Our Y2 theme is let's go from possible to easy. Let's make things easier for users, and that means. Let's give them all the missing fu functionality, but let's also develop um, ways of processing appliances that will make it easier for them, easier snapshotting, easier sharing of appliances between various different groups, um, an appliance marketplace where, where uh, different appliances are available, a user can build on top of that, but where also users can easily submit their own appliances. So we had a contribution, for example, from the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. They developed um, a, an, an infrastructure that is uh, that elastically provisions uh, um, uh, virtual machines across multiple clouds, and they packaged it all up into a chameleon appliance, uh, contributed to our uh, marketplace, so that now others can just simply take others who want to develop stuff on top of comps, which is what the infrastructure is called, called uh, can simply take that appliance and, and develop with that appliance. Uh, so all sorts of um, things that make it easier. Also, uh, a, a tool called Experiment Blueprint that allows you to repeat your experiments very, very easily. Repeat them and reproduce them. That will also um, allow others to take your experiment run it in exactly the way that, that you had run it. So this is all we're planning uh, for, for, for this year, and we're sort of in the middle uh, of developing those things right now. Ideally, why the, you know, year three theme would be uh, going from easy to efficient, but uh, my prediction is that making it easy will take us a little bit longer than that. Um, functionality um, that we still need are, is, uh, first of all, networking capabilities, Paul alluded to that. There's the stitching problem. In a presentation earlier today, I was talking about dynamic VLANs that we would like to have in order to isolate users from each other, which would make um, a, a lot of things easier. Uh, different uh, instrumentation agents, right, that send very sophisticated implementation, hardware level instrumentation uh, to Solometer, uh, better allocation management, and, and all sorts of other features. So a few uh, parting thoughts. So first of all, you know, just, just to summarize, what we developed here is a scientific instrument for computer science experimental research, right? So think about it as a telescope, microscope, as a scientific instrument for experiments. Uh, secondly, uh, work on your next project at, uh, at chameleoncloud.org, right? So come to chameleoncloud.org, uh, see if you can get an account we support all research, all academic research, also all research from the labs, uh, international collaborators and industry collaborators of academia and the labs are welcome, right? So uh, uh, very, very inclusive. And of course, um, we, we're always looking for, uh, for ways of making it sustainable. So if you, if you count, if you need Chameleon, count, uh, make it within those allocations, within the umbrella that, that NSF funded, uh, please talk to us. We would like to support every single user that we can. Um, another thing is we went from vision to reality with really express delivery. So within three months, using OpenStack, we were able to develop a new experimental tools um, tailor-made to the capabilities that the users uh, told us uh, we wanted. We ourselves were astonished um, 
how quickly that uh, that really was possible. And on a shoestring, there aren't that many people um, uh, working on Chameleon. We wanted to put as much money as we could into hardware, but uh, you've got uh, Cody Hammock, Jonathan Pastor here. Uh, I don't know if anybody else from Chameleon is here, uh, but certainly feel free to talk to them. And so we have at this point uh, operational test bed 700 plus users, 100 um, and 80 projects, more than that. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that sustainability was a very important design criterion. There are other experimental test beds using other infrastructures. What sets us apart is that we started with this blank page that I, that I showed before, and we wanted to build the test bed as an application of cloud computing because there is already infrastructure, already infrastructure exists that supports that mode um, of use. The benefits are for us because we are leveraging all the fantastic work that is going on in OpenStack. There are benefits for broader community because we contribute to projects like Blazar and, and many other projects uh, contributing new capabilities and bug fixes. And it's also for potentially other test beds or other people who would want deploy, to deploy the Chameleon infrastructure for experimental science because they may already have on staff people who are trained to, um, to administer OpenStack, right? Or, or people who've heard about cloud computing are familiar with that mode of operation. Um, so last but by not least, I wanted to introduce you to the fantastic Chameleon team. This is of course myself, I'm the Chameleon PI, and also serve as science director and, and architect of the system. Um, Joe Mambretti is, in case of the uh, programmable networks, works uh, very close with Paul right now, trying to make his application work in Chameleon. DK Panda, an expert in high performance networking, currently giving a talk in uh, the room next door. Um, uh, he is uh, doing a lot of interesting stuff with virtualization in InfiniBand. He makes sure that our InfiniBand the users can uh, make the most out of it. Paul Rudd, um, who is uh, uh, you know, a joint appointment with UTSA and Rackspace. So he's our industry liaison and also takes care of education and training. Pierre Rito, who unfortunately could not be here with us today. He's the uh, Chameleon DevOps lead and, and probably put the most blood, sweat, and tears into the development of that, um, that initial infrastructure. Uh, but somehow he chose getting married over coming to the OpenStack Summit, you know. There's no accounting for tastes. And finally, Dan Stancion, who some of you may have seen uh, yesterday uh, during the keynote in the morning. Uh, he's the director of tech and serves as facilities director on, on the Chameleon project. So with that, this is my talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Um, yes, we have. Um, so in fact, uh, currently, when you come to Chameleon, you get a quota of 20,000 service units. Well, we, a service unit is essentially a node for an hour, and uh, one node per hour. Um, when that quota expires, that's it. You, you now have to apply for an extension, and this is fine. You know, we'll, we'll, save your, uh, we'll save your image, we'll save your appliance. You can come back and, and uh, run later. Right, so you can apply for extension. The other thing that, that we found out um, last December was that actually we had so many users using Chameleon that it was impossible for people who wanted to run on hundreds of nodes to run their experiments. So uh, I showed this, uh, this, this student uh, who was comparing uh, KVM and Docker, for example. She was not able at that time to run um, uh, an experiment with enough nodes even though it had been possible before. So uh, because of that, we introduced um, a one week's limit on a single reservation. And we do make exceptions from, from that rule. There are some people who need to run uh, long running services and it's only maybe on one node and uh, you know, it's, it's within their quota otherwise, so, so that's fine. And we did, make, did have to make modifications in order to support this quota based system. Yes, absolutely. It's it's open source, so I'll I'll be, I'll be happy to point you at the code if uh, this is something that you're interested in. I was talking with someone last week about cluster design, and they said, "Oh, you know, 
HPC people, they'll never go for something like OpenStack because, you know, they, they don't like VMs even because it introduces jitter or, and all their CPUs have to be perfectly matched, otherwise variations will cause huge performance loss and they want infinite band and all this stuff. But clearly, you're doing it. So I feel like the, the, the way to reconcile this is that he's perhaps defining a very narrow Jaguar style supercomputer cluster and you're a more loosely coupled kind of cluster. I wonder if you could talk about the design space and what size of market, if you will, of HPC workloads you wanted to support and whether you feel like you've hit you know, a, a majority of those kinds of workloads with this design. Yeah, I'm delighted to talk about that because actually that's, that's the area in which I work. Um, so you're right. There is, I'd say there's HPC and HPC, right? And there's the HPC, which is the 1%, the right? The luxury end of computing, which is, uh, you know, the top 10 supercomputers in the world and, and all of that. And it's true that they are extremely suspicious of uh, virtualization because virtualization introduces jitter and, and uh, overhead and all of those things. However, if you think about this, if you have a supercomputer that's composed of a million elements, right? and on the one of those elements fails, right? You have to go back to square one, that is to your last checkpoint, right? And, and we start from there, which is a huge inefficiency. So there are programming, those programming models that require constant barriers and constant synchronization are, are not necessarily efficient anymore uh, for, the, for the newer supercomputing resources that are, that are composed of so many um, processing elements. So within HPC, for reasons completely uh, distinct from cloud computing or anything like that, there is a movement to move to a different programming model itself. So, so that's sort of, that's, that's one thing. Our kind of HPC, hundreds of nodes, is, is what in real HPC world is called medium scale. Right? Um, in, in real HPC worlds, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, and, and now millions of nodes. Um, so um, what we're trying to do is buy as many nodes as we can afford to show, to enable people to show as much scalability as they can afford. Because there is no computer science testbed right now that will support, you know, uh, scalability experiments of thousands of nodes. And, and it's very interesting that, for example, people at Argon are using Chameleon quite a bit, even though they have many other resources that they could potentially use. However, all that said, uh, cloud computing is making inroads in, in HPC right now. So I'm working on a, in a completely different hut, in a completely different sense of being. I'm working with uh, um, uh, the, the one, one of the uh, outfits, computing outfits at uh, Argonne National Lab. And we're deploying a, a sort of hybrid infrastructure that behaves a little bit like Mesos in that it runs Torque, which uh, d defines a, give, gives, a, gives out a partition to uh, Torque and then partition to OpenStack. But unlike Mesos, where those partitions are static, it dynamically negotiates the size of the partition so that if, um, if an on-demand request comes, you can borrow some, some nodes from Torque, right? People are talking about um, high performance computing malleable jobs, which uh, there are operating systems like Charm++, uh, there, are, there are frameworks that are workflow based uh, that support those malleable jobs and they can, you know, um, uh, take more resources or, or give up some resources as needed, right? So it's a very hotly debated issue right now in HPC and I don't think that we can really afford to have you know, a luxury end of 1% of, of computing somewhere there that's completely distinct and plays by very different rules than everything else in the world, right? Because then there's innovation that happens here that does not propagate here, right? So I, I, I'll, I'll be delighted to talk more about that subject later, but I see that there's another question. Well, yeah, I guess maybe a, a little follow-up point to, the, to that question as well is that, I mean, now standard CPU architectures are introducing more jitter in performance, you know, like the, the standard uh, Haswell CPU performance differences are about what, like a seven or eight percent or something is normal mm -hmm. for Intel, right? Um, um, but my question was actually, uh, you skipped really quickly over the slide that had the details of the hardware that you had, and I was interested to know whether, you know, you mentioned you've got one rack that's got InfiniBand, mm -hmm. but in the rest of the cluster, do you have RDMA capability? So do, do, I, do I have what kind of do you have do you have remote direct memory access capability in the rest of the cluster? So do you have Rocky or something over Ethernet? Okay. Well, no. So we don't. You know, we it, it's a fairly vanilla um, Haswell 
um, node cluster okay. kind of thing, right? So we, we're not, um, it, it's, it's an interesting question to what extent the users will eventually want to customize uh, those capabilities and how they will want to work mm -hmm. with that, right? But it's, you know, right, right now it's, uh, what you see is what you get. We right. might get something else in phase So, is, so is, the net, is the networking in that part of the cluster then just 10, 10 gig ethernet or something or? Uh, we've got, um, it's 10 gig. Right, okay. okay. But there so are like, connections. Yeah. So um, like your daughter board. Type, so. Yeah. Cheers. And there's actually... Yeah, yeah 40, 40 gig um, uplinks to the core network. So, but, but it's, yeah. Mostly thank you. Any other questions? I'm, I'm not sure. It's, let's go with. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. I apologize. I missed the first 10 minutes, uh, but so I may have missed this earlier on. But have you uh, looked at doing sort of any uh, bare metal workloads to help potentially reduce that impact of virtualization, the, the penalty that you pay for virtualization, and maybe some integration with I uh, Ironic to be able to do bare metal as a service uh, to allow uh, much more direct metal contact for application testing? Okay. So we. Uh, ourselves don't really run experiments as our, our users that, mm -hmm. um, that run experiments uh, typically. Our users have, I know that they have run experiments like that. Uh, in particular, one of the experiments that I mentioned out of University of Pittsburgh, uh, the, that experiment itself was comparing um, KVM and Docker. But that whole research group focuses on developing um, a lightweight hypervisor called Palacios. So if you if you Google for Palacios, you'll um, you know see how that uh, how that works, and what what they effectively do is they you know take out all the vir virtualization bits out of it, right? So there's no virtualization left. It's essentially a sort of modified operating system, like bare metal operating system. Then very carefully put it back, but they had uh, very impressive results. Um, so I I remember that they ran um, on the Sandia Redstone, which is a supercomputer at the uh, Sandia lab on thousands of nodes and, and got something like, I think, within 5% difference of execution on bare metal, which is very, very impressive. So yes, it's, it it's really worth checking out. Uh, the other interesting place to look is there's a project called Hobbs at the, uh, in the Department of Energy Space. And it's, it's, you know, there's an overlap between those two teams, but they are, they are developing a very lightweight hypervisor. And you had a question? Uh, yeah, on the uh, global storage, uh, what kind of storage do you support? Okay, wh what, uh, Cody, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, so we in fact have only a, a very small part of the of the three uh, petabytes configured and available right now, and we're trying to configure it in a way that will consume all three petabytes. Yeah, um, I'm being shown that. Oh, just one one last question. Is that okay? All right. Um, I I had two, but you can pick one. So the first one was how do you actually account for the level of usage on the uh, on the system? Um, do you actually charge back to any of the people or is it always free to use? And the other question is, how do you actually separate your tenants networking then if you don't have uh, VLANs in Ironic? I mean, I, I see that you've got um, OpenFlow enabled switches. Are you doing uh, something like network slicing with um, OpenFlow or, or what? Okay, so this is a fantastic question. We would love to do the OpenFlow slicing. We're not doing it right now. Uh, you know, the tools are not ready, so we've got people working on it. Uh, but it's not, it's not deployed in practice. I think that the, probably the first step for us will be isolated VLANs and being able to deploy that. And we need that uh, for many reasons. Number one is to deploy, to enable more interesting networking experiments. And then uh, ultimately we would like to make the, um, 
the open flow capabilities available to users. Right now they are in the hardware, but it's not, there, there isn't a good way of, of using them. Although, if you would like to use them, we would love that, and then we would be working with you the way we're working with Paul. You know, we don't quite have the capabilities that he needs to do his work, so he's both a user and also working with us uh, on doing that. And then uh, to answer your other question, how we're accounting, so we're, you know, we're taking the time for, uh, for your reservation. It's not the, the image deployment time, it's the reservation time when your reservation starts clocking in, uh, when you clock out, and we uh, charge that against your 20,000 ser service unit um, allocation, and also against your you know, lease time. Okay, thanks uh, everybody very much for listening, and uh, come and use our infrastructure, we love users.